Good morning. Hey all. I know, surprise. So a lot of you don't know me. My name is Natalia Estrada. I'm the digital scholarship librarian here at UB. Uh, can anybody on the stream or anybody who's checking the stream check to see if we're, no? Okay. But can they hear me? Okay. Awesome, thank you, Slack. Uh, so before we get to our usual conference fair, I, what? Guys, I am, hello. <laughs> before we get started, thank you. Thank you, Omar. Omar, once again, <laughs> before we get started, we do have a bit where on top of the shooting that happened in Buffalo, the shooting that happened in Orange County at a Taiwanese congregation, and now last night, a shooting at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. I do wanna start with a moment of silence to honor the dead of those shootings. So if we can give a minute, please. Thank you. Okay. Now, according to my script, hello, good mornings, niceties to you. <laughs> um, welcome to day two of Code for Live. You've made it this far. So today, Zoom speakers, please monitor Slack during your talks or try to keep your own time as we may continue to have problems with your hearing the MC, AKA me, um, from the in-room mics. We are trying to make sure everybody can hear, but sometimes technical difficulties. So help us out. Uh, any questions that you have for the speakers, um, put them or in the Code for Live channel, um, start them with a capital Q. We're gonna watch them in Slack. Um, so the speakers can scan for them and see them. This is the most efficient way that the Q&A with all the moving parts of the AV situation. Um, so help us out. Unfortunately, we do have some bad news. Kim Pham's talk, Building the Central Knowledge Graph for Digital Humanities Research Data is canceled. But she has uploaded her slides to the OSF repository. Um, there will be a morning break at 9.45 to 10.15 a.m. So, Unfortunately, we will be missing this talk, but you can still get the slides and we will have a break. For the breakout rooms, please pitch your ideas. We still have whiteboards out in the hallway. Put up those ideas. No ideas are bad ideas, except for uh, unless you include violence, please don't. Um, they will be outside of the conference room. Lightning talks, the fun ones, uh, will be from 10, 15 to 11. And there is also another sign up sheet, a flip chart out in the hallway outside of the conference room. We will begin that time with William Quinn's 10 minute talk, rescheduled from yesterday's fire alarm fun. Um, by the way, if you are a newbie and you're thinking, but Natalia, I don't have good ideas for the lightning talk. As a fellow newbie to Code for Live, I say to you, sir. You are wrong. Let me show you some possible ideas that I came up with, if I can share, hopefully. I have to actually share this with the uh, Zoom. So bear with me one second. So you are sitting there at home and you're thinking, or in the audience and you're thinking, I don't have ideas for lightning talks. I give you the following. Don't look at me, I'm typing shy. Why is the Grammarly tone indicator forever disappointed in me? And of course, 
Reaper for podcasting for cats because your cat wants to do a history podcast and you don't have Adobe Audition Bunny. So, like I said, no idea is a bad idea. Sign up for the simulation tour. I don't know what that is. It actually sounds really intense, but you should sign up for it. <laughs> it's now open at the registration desk. The simulation tour will be limited to 15 people. You too can try to save someone from appendicitis. You, if that sounds like a fun idea to you, sign up. Um, the simulation tour, tour will be at 10, 10 a.m. to 10.50 a.m. this morning. First come, first serve. Uh, please remember, the med school students will be studying for their board exams during the conference. Please be mindful of this as you socialize outside of their rooms. If they mess up those board exams, you'll find out later when they become your doctor. Um, so please be mindful. There is also a lot of anatomy classes going on, so that may impact your ability to get an elevator. The poster display boards for the poster sessions are up in the atrium in the second floor. Uh, the push bins are in the brown box on the table. You will see the push bins. Uh, please use only push bins. No tape, no super glue, no like hammers. Why did you bring a hammer to a conference? I have so many questions for you. Um, poster presenters, please get your posters up before this present poster session at 3.30, but uh, preferably as early as possible. If you can do it now, I suggest you do it now. Um, but then you miss me. And really, that's what we're all here for. Uh, the community service volunteers for this morning, and I apologize if I mess up your name and mess up this mic, uh, but the volunteers for this morning are Tess Gridach, Gridach? All right, nobody's yelling at me. And Andromeda Yelton until 11 a.m. Then Chad Nelson and Bobby Fox from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. They are located in the back of the room with their zebra striped lanyards. Uh, the online community support volunteer is Daniel Sanford. You'll find him at Dan's on Slack until 1 p.m. Now, I'm very excited for this next part. We want to congratulate the 2022 Diversity Scholarship winners. So I'm gonna read out some names, hold your applause until then, but we would like to congratulate Erica Barber, David Broom, Tiffany Chung, Hyung Wok Cho, Chanda Hardin, Su Jiang Herring, Jalesia Horton, Fezia Jahan Shadi, Chen Yo Jiao, Dr. Raj Kumar, Grace Lu, Meng Chu, Johnny Miller, Dua Tang. Congratulations, you guys. <laughs> And a big thank you to MIT Libraries, Princeton University Library, Penn State University, the University of Buffalo Libraries, the University of Michigan Library, and the generous individuals in the Code for Live community for making these scholarships possible. It's viewers like you. We would, <laughs> we would also like to thank our sponsors at the supporter level, Vail, Archive Space, Metro, the School of Information, UBC, Sam Vera, Bywater Solutions, LLC, the School of Information and Library Science at UNC Chapel Hill, Carnegie Mellon. So with that, oh, we have five minutes. Uh, in the meantime, are our talks ready? Do we want to go ahead with the talks or I can just keep bantering? We could also propose more bad lightning talk ideas. Yeah, see, that's what I'm afraid of. I also want to check in. Amy Rustin, are you here? Would you like to start early? You are the first. Our Zoom people, Madison Chartier and Megan Mackin, are you around? Yes, we're here. Yes, hello. Hello. <laughs> So if everybody is all good, if you are ready, let us start with our first talk. Uh, Omar is gonna mic you up. Amy Ruskin will be talking Wikidata versus custom Wikibases, community history case studies. Everybody give a hand for Amy.
I think I can make it a bit smaller with the, the bottom setting cut off. But Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Amy Ruskin. I'm the data engineer in the digital scholarship group at the Northeastern University Library. Um, and I'm going to be presenting on Wikidata and custom Wikibases, and specifically in the context of two of our current projects. So for those who aren't familiar, uh, Wikidata is a free collaborative knowledge base under the Wikimedia umbrella. Um, it started in 2012, um, and it currently contains over 97 million items uh, representing both concrete real world entities and abstract concepts. Uh, it also has, I think, about 10,000 properties uh, that can be used to describe those items. Um, so all the data in Wikidata can be edited and viewed by anyone. Wikibase is the knowledge base software underlying Wikidata. So it was originally uh, written for Wikidata and Wikidata is probably still the most uh, famous and largest instance of it. Uh, but you can also um, install your own instance of Wikibase and populate it however you want. Um, there are a lot of other cool projects out there using this. Um, so in the context of this talk, when I refer to Wikibase, I'll mostly be using that as shorthand for a custom non-Wikidata instance of Wikibase. Uh, so we don't have time to get deep into the Wikibase data model, but to give you a sense of what um, data looks like uh, in this context, uh, here's an example of the Wikidata item representing the Make Way for Ducklings sculpture in Boston Common. Um, and a few things to highlight here is that the items uh, get unique identifiers. That's the number preceded by Q at the top, um, multilingual labels, descriptions, and aliases, um, and a bunch of statements uh, representing sort of facts about that item. And those are made up of properties and different types of values. Um, properties will look fairly similar to this. Um, items can also have site links that uh, point to the representations of that same concept or entity on uh, other sites in Wikimedia. So for example, in this one, um, it's linked to the English language Wikipedia article for that sculpture and the um, commons category with photos of it. Um, so for some more context on the projects I'm gonna discuss, these are both under the auspices of the Boston Research Center or BRC, uh, which is a digital community history and archives lab based in the Northeastern University Library. Um, so the BRC is focused on building collections and partnerships with social justice organizations around Boston. Um, right now, we have uh, partnerships with organizations in the Boston neighborhoods of Chinatown, Roxbury, East Boston, and the South End. Um, and so that partnership with external organizations is really key here. Um, so our role in the library is to provide technical infrastructure for these local history projects, um, but all the decisions we make need to be driven by the needs of those organizations. So the first project I'm gonna discuss uh, uses Wikidata and this is a uh, neighborhood public art in Boston. Um, so for some background on this, there's a local artist donating her archives to Northeastern. Um, and among those um, materials are some spreadsheets with very detailed information about works of public art around Boston because she's been tracking that data for over a decade. Uh, so we've been using those as a starting point to gather and preserve information about uh, works and artists in the neighborhoods of Boston that BRC is focused on. And eventually we want to use that to create map visualizations and public art walking tours around different neighborhoods and themes. So there are a lot of other people and organizations already tracking data about public art in Boston. Uh, the city of Boston has a very cool mural map up. 
there's various arts organizations that publish information um, about work produced under their initiatives. And then of course, all these journalists, researchers, other enthusiasts all doing their own thing. Um, but no one seems to have like a complete list of the works of public art around Boston. And in discussing this project uh, with potential partners, it seemed that we both couldn't and shouldn't try to centralize all this into one local repository. Because all these groups and um, people have different local needs for how they're using the data, and the question of who should ultimately own or control that data is kind of tricky. Um, so we settled on using Wikidata uh, for this project, um, which gets around that sort of tricky question of ownership, um, because then Northeastern's role uh, can be to help uh, standardize and aggregate um, this data without ultimately owning or controlling it. Um, so it's a way to sort of take what we have and make it accessible for anyone to do whatever they want with um, and also invite people in to contribute their own knowledge. From a more technical perspective, Wikidata lets us handle more complex information than we could in just spreadsheets and also offers more flexibility than a relational database would. Um, and because of all of the work that's already been done in Wikidata, um, it can help us sort of build up this network of the like Boston public art world. So not just um, works and their artists, but also like the art schools that artists went to, the activist organizations they participate in, um, you know, parks and schools with mural walls. Um, the visualization tools bundled with the Wikidata query service also make it really easy for us to get maps, maps, graphs, and charts right off the bat that we can show to potential partners. Um, so I've included uh, in this slide a screenshot of an example map visualization you can produce with just those tools. And there were already some established practices for modeling public art in Wikidata, so uh, we didn't have to start completely from scratch there. Um, so where we're at right now with this project, um, we've added or modified items for over 200 works of art and over 100 artists. Um, we've created a wiki project page uh, for this project uh, that has our data models, example queries, um, some lists of research resources, and we're really hoping that can be a useful reference for anyone uh, to participate in this project or to start similar projects. Uh, we've had two little edit-a-thons so far and we're hoping to have more in the future. Um, so now the second project that uses a custom wiki base is the Chinatown Collection Survey. Um, yeah, and so some background on this. Um, so the BRC initially met with community organizations around Boston Chinatown to sort of get a sense of uh, what kind of uh, projects we could uh, help facilitate. And it turned out there were al already a lot of oral history projects and other sort of like digital projects happening in that community. And they didn't really need um, Northeastern's help in making those happen. Uh, but would what would be useful would be to sort of inventory all of the collections around Boston or Massachusetts in general with like uh, information about Boston's Chinatown. Uh, so in collaboration with the Boston Public Library, we sent out a survey um, in English, simplified and traditional Chinese uh, to people and organizations around Boston asking about any sort of materials they might have related to Boston's Chinatown. And so the project goal here is to then take those survey responses, uh, structure them, translate them, and create a searchable and browsable multilingual directory of collections. Um, so this, it's really not a lot of data, um, but there are some specific needs that mean we want to go beyond spreadsheets for how we handle and store it. Um, so the eventual interface needs to be multilingual. Um, so we want to be able to represent both field names and values in English and Chinese in the database. Uh, we're representing several different types of entities. So we want to be able to represent collections, people, organizations, and the different types of relationships between them. Um, it would also be nice to have something lightweight and easy to implement, because again, this isn't big data, um, to have an editing interface that we don't have to build ourselves, um, that allows people to add or edit data directly into the database, um, and to have flexibility in the schema or no schema at all, so that we can expand the project scope down the line either by adding in different types of entities like events and topics, 
um, and dealing with some idiosyncratic entities um, because we're defining collection pretty broadly here. So it's not just formal archival collections and the sort of associated metadata, but also art installations, blogs, and personal collections. Uh, so Wikibase and by extension Wikidata uh, fits some of those, a lot of those needs, um, in particular the way that uh, multilingual labels, descriptions, and aliases are handled for both items and properties are a big reason why we're going with that. Um, but there are some reasons to choose a custom Wikibase over Wikidata. Uh, so not all of the items we're creating would be appropriate for inclusion in Wikidata, either because they don't meet the notability guidelines or because we want to protect people's privacy. Um, a custom Wikibase gives us more control over modeling practices. Uh, so we don't have to inherit Wikidata modeling efforts that wouldn't make sense in this localized context. And we can also add properties specific to our usage that wouldn't make sense in the broader context of Wikidata. Uh, it gives us more control over editing access so we don't have to be as worried about vandalism. And although this is not the best reason to choose to use that technology, there's been some discussion of um, using Wikibase more broadly in the library, and this seemed like a good pilot project for that. Uh, so right now we're still processing and following up on survey responses, but we have an instance of Wikibase suite deployed on AWS, um, and we've started populating it. Um, so there are a lot of finer distinctions here, but I think these are sort of the two big takeaways on uh, choosing between Wikidata and a custom Wikibase for a project, certainly in how we've gone about it. Uh, so when you start a project in Wikidata, you become part of this larger community. Um, so there's all these external services that use Wikidata. Um, and so the changes you make there sort of propagate beyond what you're doing uh, for better or worse. Um, Editors outside of your organization can come in and make changes to the items you're using, again, for better or worse, like they might be enriching those items, they might be vandalizing those items, they might just be making changes that mess with your models in ways that you don't expect. Um, there's all the existing work you can build off of and add to. So again, the like over 97 million items, like 10,000 properties, all these uh, wiki projects, that are you know, community efforts uh, to establish modeling practices in certain domains. Uh, with custom Wikibases, on the other hand, uh, give you more control over all aspects of your project. Um, and again, this can also be a double-edged sword. Uh, so you're responsible for installing um, and maintaining the software. Um, Wikibase Cloud should make this easier in the future, but so far every presentation I've heard on Wikibases has mentioned uh, what a pain they were to set up and our experience was no different there. Uh, it gives you more control over your data models uh, so you can create properties without going through the property proposal process you'd have to go through on Wikidata and you can enforce how they're used um, because you also have more control over editing access. Um, so that can help mitigate vandalism um, or just unexpected edits that might have effects on the services pulling in data from your wiki base. Um, because you can also control uh, who, who views it, you can control what sort of uh, external services are using it. Um, so yes, uh, that's all I have. Um, thank you. Uh, feel free to email me uh, at the address there. Thank you, Amy. Oh. So next up, we have Madison Chartier and Megan Mackin, the subjects of linked data, facilitating informed decisions and securing permissions to implement linked open data for Oklahoma native artists. Also, before we have them go, just a quick note, if you are presenting, if we could have you do your slides uh, in full screen for better visibility, we appreciate. Are we, are we good, guys? Yells? I think so. Oh. 
All right. Well, um, hello, and uh, thank you for tuning in to our presentation this morning. Uh, we are Madison Chartier and Megan Mackin of Oklahoma State University Library, and we are excited to share with you the development and considerations of our first linked open data project with one of our most unique and important collections at OSU. Linked open data, uh, particularly Wikidata, offers a compelling solution for improving discoverability of library collections representing marginalized groups. The potential of linked open data to uncover previously obscured relationships between entities, however, calls for a thoughtful examination of its possible repercussions on living individuals and their communities. The question of on whose terms should inclusion take place as raised in Ash Milby and Phillips's Inclusivity or Sovereignty, Native American Arts in the Gallery and Museum since 1992, obliges us to consider the impacts of linked open data more critically when applied to living artists as opposed to their created art. Is it possible for libraries to embrace the increased visibility of linked open data while respecting the priorities, privacy, and self-representation of living individuals? Furthermore, in the case of Native American artists, is there a way to create linked open data that recognizes these artists as citizens of sovereign nations with unique cultural histories and as active participants in the international contemporary art scene? Oklahoma State University Library wrestled with these questions while developing linked open data for indigenous artists featured in the Oklahoma Native Artists Oral History Series, or the ONA series. Uh, since 2010, Dr. Julie Pearson Little Thunder from the OSU Library's Oklahoma Oral History Research Program has interviewed 141 people for the ONA series. Interviewees include enrolled citizens of tribal nations and artists of self-identified indigenous ancestry, as well as festival and exhibition organizers, gallery owners, and collectors. In the interviews, they talk about their family and tribal backgrounds, uh, their schooling, business strategies, shows and awards, their creative processes, subject matter, as well as techniques. And the purpose of this oral history series is to document and share with the public the history and culture of Native artists with an Oklahoma connection. There's an inherent tension between data sovereignty and the inclusion that linked open data, particularly Wikidata, promises. So let's take a look at how the particular case of Oklahoma and OSU history has impacted sovereignty. Then we'll tie it back to the data. Uh, the his this history is relevant not just to Oklahoma, but to all of the U.S., since tribal nations originating from across the country, maybe some of those you mentioned in your own land acknowledgments, now live here in Oklahoma. The original inhabitants of Stillwater, where we are located today, and the surrounding areas spoke languages from the Caddoan, Kiowa Tanoan, and Siouan language families. As a result of forcible removal and broken treaties, today the state of Oklahoma is home to 39 sovereign nations from across North America. We encourage you to visit the website of the Center for Sovereign Nations located at Oklahoma State University to learn more about them. Treaties concerning land in present Oklahoma were first signed between the US government and tribal nations in 1818. By the 1830s, the Indian Removal and Trade Acts established Indian territory, the name generally used to describe Oklahoma prior to its 1907 statehood as a reservation for nations forcibly displaced from the Southeastern United States. During the second half of the 19th century, Indian territory functioned as a holding zone for diverse indigenous peoples uprooted from the Northeast, Midwest, and West as a result of American wars of expansion or so-called Indian wars. In 1862, with the first Morrill Act, land grant universities began profiting from the sale of stolen lands gifted to them by the federal government. Oklahoma State University, the land grant institution where we work was founded under the Morrill Act in 1890. And finally, the allotment process of the 1887 Dawes Act, which linked tribal membership and privatized land holding, was purposely crafted by the US Congress to open Indian territory to non-native settlers and to, introduce, and to induce statehood in 1907. These repeated federal land seizures have had resonating impacts on native identity and culture. The layers of complexity that make up indigenous identity are compounded in Oklahoma by removal, land seizures, broken treaties, and related programs like the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. 
data collection is a pervasive theme throughout this history. The contents of this data, tribal enrollment, for example, determined who the federal government allowed to own land and also set them up as targets for further violence. Data structured and collected by colonizing institutions, whether a land grant in the university or even Wikidata, rather than indigenous people themselves, reinforces these harmful systems. Since we are concerned with creating linked open data for artists, we are also aware that indigenous artists are subject to laws regulating who may call themselves a Native American artist and market their work as such. The 1974 Oklahoma American Indian Arts and Crafts Act required tribal membership to sell Native American art. Then later, the 1990 Federal Indian Arts and Crafts Act regulates who may call themselves a Native American artist. These laws underscore how the identity of Native American artists is bound by complicated legal considerations, in addition to the complex historical, ethical, and individual factors that may shape their identity. Nancy Marie Mithlow discusses the complexity of Native American artists' identity in terms of sovereignty, beginning with indigenous artists who claim to have, quote, no word for art in their language. Quote, from one perspective, the no word for art descriptor indicates an indigenous rejection of how native arts are perceived in non-native contexts, such as museums, cultural centers, galleries, and scholarly texts, maybe Wikidata, Wikipedia, contexts that imbue fine arts with the Western values of individualism, commercialism, objectivism, and competition as framed by an elitist point of reference. Continue the quote here, a rejection of the term art is then a rejection of Western culture as capitalist, patriarchal, and ultimately shallow, one that does not value the central principles of indigenous identity, such as land, language, family, family and spirituality. That's from Nancy Marie Mithlow, quote, uh, no word for art in our language, old questions, new paradigms. So on the one hand, we have Western culture with its individualism, commercialism, objectivism, competition, and shallow capitalist patriarchy. We could use some of these words to describe perhaps Wikipedia and Wikidata. And I'm thinking of a case I heard about from the Black Lunch Table where a Wikipedia editor rejected an artist as not notable enough because they only had a few pieces of art in a group exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art. But meanwhile, most Native American artists have been excluded from contemporary art museums altogether and so would not be notable at all. On the other hand, we have the central principles of indigenous identity, such as land, language, family, and spirituality, which may lead artists to reject classifications necessary to, excuse me, to create linked open data. And in any case, they're not easily reduced to data points. So given this background, what would be the purpose of proceeding with linked open data? So going back to that original question, Ash Milby and Phillips who asked on whose terms should inclusion take place, um, they conclude institutional practices that accurately reflect 21st century art worlds can only emerge when Native American and settler arts remain in dialogue. GLAM institutions are very actively contributing their art information to Wikidata. So indigenous artists absence from the platform may further remove them from this conversation. This data is already being created. Some of the Oklahoma Native artists already have Wikidata profiles, so this would be an opportunity to spread awareness and continue dialogue among artists whom we, with whom we already have relationships. And by creating linked open data for the oral history series via Wikidata, the OSU Library has several aims. To offer Oklahoma Native artists more visibility online, to provide a new vantage point for interacting with oral history transcripts, to further support both grassroots and academic research on Indigenous history and culture, and to engage students in the scholarly conversation about Indigenous culture, and finally to draw connections between siloed collections. And although this unique oral history series is cataloged, transcribed, and made publicly available online, much of the exhibition history contained in these interviews, including representation in museums, regional art fairs, or international exhibitions, would be much more accessible and extensible as structured data. Linked open data promises not only to interlink Native artists with their work in library and museum collections, but also to activate these artists' archives for inclusion in contemporary art discourse and research. Linked open data could highlight connections between Native art exhibition metadata and recordings of the artists' oral history interviews, between their professional profiles, artworks, related publications, and other Native American collections at OSU and elsewhere. Securing artists' permission to create linked open data from their interviews is important. Linked open data is generally not a familiar topic for artists and its impacts may not be readily known. Linked open data on Wikidata, for example, could take native artists' information from the local sphere of our library website to a very visible Google knowledge panel. 
And linked open data is also easier to share and repurpose. So outside editors on Wikidata could publish details the artist does not wish to have broadcasted. Additionally, linked open data can only hint at the context offered in oral histories. A context is particularly important for native artists um, whose presentation of identity switches depending on whether their audience be institutions such as libraries and museums or the public they encounter at fairs, festivals and other engagements or even their own communities. So while oral history is not blameless, it does offer interviewees a platform for their own voices, unlike most linked open data, unless that data is created by the artists themselves. So these contextual nuances risk erosion of meaning and even misrepresentation when translated from an oral history narrative to standardized data. Therefore, clear communication is vital to ensure the artists understand the project, including its benefits and risks, before consenting to have the library create linked open data about them. We consequently dedicated substantial time and effort to devise a clear, well-documented communication process that aligns with the care principles of indigenous data governance and the oral history associations principles and best practices when approaching artists about the project. So as a member of the Oklahoma Native Artists Community and as the oral historian who conducted the original interviews, Dr. Julie Pearson Little Thunder serves as the liaison to the artists for this linked open data project. She contacts artists by phone to talk through the project and discuss the data we have compiled and secure their permission to publish their data on Wikidata. As part of this process, she refers to two FAQ documents we created, which the artists may view if they wish. These FAQs address the usefulness of Wikidata for researchers, uh, the possibility of greater representation for Native artists as a group, and publicity for the individual artist. Uh, these FAQs also inform artists of the potential proliferation and modifications of the data. And we express our commitment to facilitate changes in the future and to offer training and support for both individual and community involvement in editing Wikipedia and Wikidata entries. So Dr. Pearson Little Thunder then asks whether the artist would like to have a Wikidata profile created or edited for them and discusses options, discusses options, excuse me. If an artist says yes, we ask them to provide their CV so we can include exhibition and award data. Artists may request changes to their data. And if so, these are relayed to the metadata librarian who updates the, the data in the project spreadsheet. If an artist says no, we first offer an alternative. We ask if they would consider an OSU curated linked open data profile instead which would be hosted on an OSU controlled platform where we can more readily secure the integrity of the artist's personal information. If they agree to this alternative, we ask for their CV and hold their data for publication until the platform is developed. If they still say no, we conclude the interview there with that understanding and proceed no further. We also assist with removing already existing Wikipedia pages or Wikidata profiles if artists request so. Later, Dr. Pearson Little Thunder follows up with artists via email, reiterating in writing her understanding of the phone conversation to make sure the artist's wishes are accurately recorded. We archive these emails and document an artist's agreement to have a linked open data profile created or edited for them on a checklist. This communication process is necessarily time consuming. Presently, only a small portion of the 141 artists have been contacted and have granted their permission to publish Wikidata. The response so far has been positive with few, few requests to change our existing data. Um, artists are generally interested in learning about the platform for themselves, sometimes with the help of their family. Uh, Wikidata will be created in bulk after more discussions with artists have taken place. So while we wait for artist responses, we have shifted our focus toward bibliographic research and then we'll loop back to linked open data. We've hired a history PhD student who is researching artists in art historical sources and community based publications such as tribal newspapers and local media outlets. We are identifying museum holdings and exhibition histories and we um, as we develop bibliographies for artists, we may be entering linked open data for these resources before we're able to 
to share that data for the artists themselves. So thank you so much for your time today and to our project collaborator collaborators, Dr. Julie Pearson Little Thunder and Sarah Milligan and to the artists for sharing their experiences with the public. Someday we will all learn technology. Um, thank you. All right. We are now going to have our first break of the day. It will be our morning break. It will be up till 1015. But make sure you're back in time because we will start then with our talk that we're going to make up from yesterday from the fire evacuation and then our lightning talks. So, oh. Okay, <laughs> you can't do this because then you get my attention. <laughs> but yeah, if you need coffee, now's your chance. If you need to run to the bathroom, now's your chance. If you just need to chill out, we have our quiet room in the back across the hallway, but break time.
you. I'm Ken. We first need to put a hashtag in the title of the document, which I think Mac likes and Windows might not. So let's see how that works out.
Testing one zero, testing one zero.
Hello. Bill, can you hear us? Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Okay. Great. Okay, so we are gonna start our lightning talk round with a non-lightning talk. So William Reed Quinn will be giving his presentation. Thank you, Bill. From raw data to leaflet maps. Take it away. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everyone. And a special thank you to the conference organizers and planners and everyone working so hard to set up and maintain everything as a hybrid format. Um, I apologize if there's any background noise. Um, our dogs are going a little crazy. Uh, my talk today is about the ways the Digital Scholarship Group at Northeastern University and the Massachusetts Historical Society have been developing multiple projects that share an interest in data and analysis and visualizations, uh, particularly in georeferencing. Part of this development is planning a workflow that can infer georeference data from a variety of data structures. In addition to describing how we move from raw or at least diverse data to leaflet maps, I also wanna intertwine a consideration of how and why we are knowingly creating bad data. One of our current projects is the Primary Source Cooperative, which offers a useful case study of our choices in technologies. The co-op consists of four, oh, is this not full screen? Yeah, Bill, if you can put it in presentation mode. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, there, for the first slide too. Um, so the co-op consists of four documentary editing projects at different stages of production. These projects include the John Quincy Adams Diary Digital Project, the Catherine Maria Cedric Online Letters, the Ellen Swallow Richards Papers, and the Roger Brooke Taney Papers. Each project covers an important figure of 19th century American history, whose lives and acquaintances occasionally overlapped. Furthermore, each project is at a different stage of development and operating under different funding and labor conditions. All of this is to say our options for receiving data and producing georeferencing needed to be flexible. Before we receive anything, the co-op works together as editors, subject matter experts, and folks with expertise in information infrastructures transform historical materials into XML either by directly transcribing them in text editors like Oxygen or through transformations from Word documents, uh, something that's a little out of scope for this paper. After that, however, our data workflow with the co-op can be broken down into three main parts, all of which can be bundled and ran within the same Python script. Parsing the co-op's XML files is the first step we take. The parser's main goal is to separate parts of the document we consider to be the body of the text from its metadata. For example, we take the notes John Quincy Adams wrote to himself in his diary and convert that into a single string so that we essentially have one string, one text string per entry. Uh, we're using the XML element tree, a Python library for this parsing task, which can leverage XPath it helps us sort through encoded information. Using pandas, another Python library, we can store the parse information and maintain the affiliation between metadata, like the date Adams wrote the note, and the string information. The result is a data frame or large table of information that includes metadata we want to hold on to for later. Parsing XML has become an increasingly crucial step at um, the Digital Scholarship Group, the DSG, because uh, many projects are opting into the richness of XML TEI, uh, especially for producing digital editions. As these projects grow and digitize more materials, it becomes more important to see large scale corpus patterns. 
While there are other options for parsing data, Python allows us to stay in the same code environment as we move from data extraction and manipulation to natural language processing. The second step in this workflow is named entity recognition. Uh, we are using the Python library Spacey for this task. Spacey is a suite of natural language processing tools that we are using to detect parts of speech and named entities. For our purposes, we're particularly focused on entities that refer to countries, states of power, or regional local places. We are also interested in places of natural phenomenon like mountain ranges or lakes. Uh, Spacey reads in our plain text string and uses probabilistic functions to guess when a name entity occurs. As you can probably guess, this is where bad data comes into play. Spacey was trained on modern English, uh, in this case, which very often struggles with historical writing practices. Language models like the one Spacey uses could not anticipate all forms of historical English. To complicate matters even further, John Quincy Adams occasionally writes notes in very brief, um, short, terse ways, jotting down only the bare essentials of his day and sometimes ignoring grammar altogether. Therefore, we are deliberately asking Spacey to use a language model, a natural language model of modern English to understand the unnatural language of Adams' historical note-taking. I'll return to why we're using Spacey or any natural language processing in a minute. I next want to describe the last component of our data process, a URL driver, driver that accesses OpenStreetMap's API. OpenStreetMap.org is a free open source map of the world that can return longitude and latitude coordinates. A community of diverse users contribute and refine data uh, and as such, I can search any place and it'll return the coordinates. We can automate this process in Python using the response library. Rather than manually typing in every location, Python can do this busy work for us. What we end up with is a new data frame that has place names, their longitude, latitude coordinates, the files they appear in, and other metadata from the XML. Here again, though, we need to be cautious of the results. Just as our inferred georeference data might be incorrect, searching for place coordinates without context can produce another layer of incorrect information. Furthermore, as to historical documents, mentioned places may no longer exist or describe a different place with the same name. However, once these three steps are completed, we can then save the coordinate information as a JSON and file, feed that directly into Leaflet. Uh, and here is a um, early visualization of our um, georeferencing of John Quincy Adams' this diary. Uh, we will be building out our Leaflet maps over the summer so that the maps we visualize can return users back to the historical documents for further information and investigation. As I mentioned though, this workflow still has to contend with bad data. The problem begins once we apply contemporary English models to historical documents that are not always written in quote unquote natural language, i.e. diary notes. So the big question for us is why bother? What, what value does inaccurate data provide? We think there are a few productive reasons to create bad data and we hope quite a bit of good data too. The first and perhaps most important reason is that nothing about this process commits data to the XML files. Sorry again, if the dogs are coming through. The data we produce are not hard coded back into the XML files. So anything that we do can be undone. Even though the data we're producing are not durable, that is they exist outside of the XML as JSON data and can be refreshed every time we run the Python script, they nevertheless help promote interest in georeferencing data and eventually we hope shift practices towards um, directly encoding georeference places in the XML uh, by hand. Again, we would prefer this method, um, but we understand that this takes more time and money, which obviously isn't always available in many places. Lastly, we believe that creating 
data can be an iterative process. Uh, the bad data we're creating is a foothold for next steps. We can use libraries like Spacey to pinpoint places in data and documents where we think a place name is mentioned. We can think of Spacey's georeference data as breadcrumbs. Whether or not they're accurate, we will end up with a trail of possible place names. This allows editors to work through documents focused on a specific task, which is less burdensome than reading through the entire corpus once again. Currently, we are developing a human in the loop process uh, that uses this name entity recognition process, but provides a context, usually about five to 10 words before and after the supposed place name. Uh, and this will take the um, look like a API interface, essentially. And editors can then confirm or reject species prediction. If they confirm results, those results will be written into the XML and saved with future iterations. Even further down the road, once the editors have had a chance to confirm this data, we hope to use this new and accurate information to prototype bespoke language models. Spacey allows users to customize language models. So for example, once we have enough place names in John Quincy Adams's corpus, we might be able to improve the accuracy of our own language model using the newly added place names. This, of course, will require many trials and inevitable failures, but it's nevertheless more feasible than working through the more than 17,000 entries that have been tr transcribed so far. Throughout this process, as it's currently envisioned, human subject matters, um, experts with uh, subject matter, will work through the language models to discover new, new data. While we're certain that there are poor results in our data, we hope our long-term solutions will be able to leverage short-term errors and help clean up the data. This approach of accepting bad data also lessens the burden on the editors whose work on their project is often one among many duties and responsibilities. Ultimately, we hope that our approach will encourage editors to adopt practices that include more accurate georeferencing without such a heavy burden. Our approach also keeps in view the notion that data work is an ongoing service rather than a product. And we hope to assist them and refine our own methods as this project continues. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and uh, our georeferencing, Python scripts, and, and many more things we've been working on are available at our GitHub. Thank you. Give it up for Bill after having to reschedule his talk. <laughs> all right. Now what we're all here for, the lightning talks. You know the rules. You got five minutes and you got short talks. Let's start. Elena Bianco, come on down. I wish I had theme music for this. I was thinking more Price is Right. <laughs> All right. You ready with your small talk? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, cool. Do you I, have slides? I, yeah, I've got the slide version. Am I advancing on my slides? Or? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I will leave it to you and I will also leave you with the mic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, please use mic. Okay. Uh, you got to turn it on first. Okay. Hang on. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Thank you. So I'm Elena Bianco, and uh, I work at uh, Skagit Valley College. I can go ahead, and, and we are a rural college uh, in Mount Vernon, Washington, just north of Seattle. And we are uh, very small. We serve a uh, a lot of first generation and low income students. We. Uh, are in the process of becoming a Hispanic serving institution. And we are very, very underfunded in terms of both our library and our IT department. Our library serves two campuses and we have uh, three full-time librarians and one half-time librarian uh, for those two campuses. Um, and uh, we are 
Um, as an institution uh, working on a grant that was administered by Bellevue College uh, for all of the 34 statewide community and technical colleges uh, to undergo something called course-based undergraduate research experience. This is a high impact equity-based um, uh, initiative to try and get students uh, more engaged in the scholarly research process. We are a two-year community college. We have started offering um, applied baccalaureate uh, programs, and we are hoping that this is a way to engage and increase our enrollment. And uh, the library has was approached uh, by our uh, grant administrators uh, who are a science faculty and the Dean of Arts and Sciences to play a role in this. And so um, the three things, initially it was to provide information literacy in the courses that are going to have this undergraduate research project, project. But we've also now started talking about, could we help with a digital repository um, for uh, data that's collected? Can we also provide a site to help publish the student work when it's done? And so um, we were super excited to be invited to participate in this way, because as a small library, we're always struggling to try and be relevant to the, the institution's mission. And this aligns beautifully with the college's um, theme of equitable student achievement. And um, it fits, it's in our wheelhouse, right? This is our area of expertise. We should be the people that the college looks to, to do this. However, the big con is the workload. As I said, we're hugely stressed. Um, all of the community and technical colleges were literally like at the max when we had to implement Alma Primo. And we just think this might kill us. <laughs> we are not sure how we are going to do this. And so that's one reason why um, Bobby and Ken were, uh, were like, hey, you should give a lightning talk. So we're hoping to get expertise and ideas from people smarter than us, i.e. you all, to help us with this conundrum. So the questions are, what kind of a solution? Two of our colleges have taken the lead. Whatcom Community College is implementing um, Omeka S, and um, they're, uh, it's on Reclaim Hosting, and they are displaying their student work already on this. Shoreline Community College is looking at DSpace. However, their IT department just yesterday nixed that idea because they cannot support it. So um, some of us are saying, hey, can we use Esploro? Is that a possible solution? We're ex Libris libraries after all. That comes with a cost. Many of us also have content DM. Is that a solution? Are there other solutions? If people have ideas, I would love to hear from you um, and, and let us know. And the other question is, how do we keep it sustainable? Um, I have already approached our grant leads and said, hey, you want our help? You need to include funding in the grant to be able to help staff, not only the library, but our IT department, which suffered huge cutbacks in 2008, and they haven't recovered that staffing. We're also looking at partnering with our institutions statewide. We've created a statewide community of practice. We've started up a listserv. We're hoping to share ideas. I've included the link to that um, listserv so that if any of you would like to join us, even if you're not in Washington state and see what our progress is, you're welcome to join. Um, and then I've already talked about the idea of what solutions do we go with open source, which is free, helps our budget, uh, but we don't have the support for that, or out of the box, which is helpful for us development wise, but oh my gosh, it includes money that, <laughs> that we don't have. Um, and even if we do get the money through the grant to pay for something, how do we maintain it for the long term? Like what happens once the grant goes away? Like, do the efforts die or, or do we keep up? So um, that's it. This is our context. There's a list of links. Um, Rowena McKernan and Caitlin Maxwell, who are not here, um, are both faculty in our statewide colleges that have done a fantastic job uh, with creating this, um, some of these resources and, and sharing out 
um, and creating this community of practice listserv. So that's my, my talk. So thanks everybody. Next up. Oh, no, not that one. Sorry. There we go. Next up, we got Dre. Hey, is this mic working? Hey, this mic is working. All right. <clears throat> so, pre disclaimer there's a lot of clip art, or not clip art, uh, stock images in this um, talk. Everything except one image is a stock image that I just stole from the internet without looking at where it came from. Uh, so, there are no image credits and all that other stuff. Sorry. Uh, okay. Baby versus ficus. So this is a problem in uh, information architecture, also in information design, and it's called the nursery problem. And a nursery isn't, oh wait, I'm pausing. Carlin, what's up? Oh, I'm not sharing the screen because I'm a Duma. Come on, there we go. No, 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 no. You're seeing my slides before I'm ready. Uh, Zoom, where are you? Ah, uh, thank you. All right, I'm starting my time over, otherwise I will never have enough time. Sorry, I am using, I'm, I'm cashing in on like 15 years of code for lib cred. All right, full screen, please. Oh, do I have to do function F11? No, F there we go, okay. All right, okay. All right, so uh, for those people who are watching the live stream, I give my pre disclaimer baby versus ficus. This is a problem in information architecture and a problem in information design. The nursery problem. Nursery is an interesting word in English. It has several meanings. Uh, one of the meanings of the word nursery is a place where you find babies. Um, and another meaning of the word nursery is a place where you find ficuses, okay? Now, <clears throat> if you go to this nursery and you want to get a ficus, it mostly doesn't matter what ficus you get. You, as long as you come away with a ficus, you're pretty much happy. Uh, but if you go to this nursery and you come away with a baby, you want to make damn sure you got the baby you meant to get, right? So that's the nursery problem. Um, what does this have to do with information architecture? Okay, so let's say you're building, uh, this is the problem in information architecture is sometimes we have to decide whether things are more like babies and sometimes we have to decide whether they're more like ficuses. So if you're, for instance, building uh, an HR database and you want to record some information about your employees, maybe for some reason you need to know about their cars, right? Maybe you need to issue parking passes or something, right? Now, if you're really lucky, you can make things very simple um, uh, and you can treat uh, cars like ficuses. Um, so you can just make, keep track of the number of cars the employee owns. Maybe you just need to mail them the right number of parking passes. Um, or you might need to treat cars more like babies where you care about the different cars and you want to collect their details. So here your ER diagram looks a little bit more like this where a car is an entity in and of itself. And we also need to record a lot of information about what the car is like. Uh, here we're treating the car a little bit more like a baby. Because um, we care about the different cars and their distinct distinctiveness from each other. Um, <clears throat> so how is this a problem in information design? Well, a lot of times <clears throat> we have things in information design, uh, we have things that we care about, which we're already treating like babies, right? We care about them on the individual level. But when we present them to the user, we might want to think about whether the user cares about the thing like a baby or if they care about it like a ficus. Right, so if we think about a computer, you know, if your IT department is doing things right, they think about their computers like babies. Um, they have all the detailed information about each computer. They know exactly where it lives and all of its little details and what version of software it's running, et cetera. So a computer for your IT department is a baby or it should be, but, if you're showing your computers to your users and where they are in the library, you kind of really just want to tell them where the piles of computers are and how many of them there are so they can find 
a computer when they need it. So for your users, computers are really more like ficuses, right? So uh, that's the nursery problem. Do you treat the thing like a baby or you treat the thing like a ficus? And you have to do it at two levels, both when you're recording the information about the thing and then when you're presenting the information about the thing. Now, anyone who manages information is probably already doing this, right? This is a decision you make all the time when you're doing any kind of information architecture or any kind of presentation of information to people. But now you have words for it. And now you can ask the question, is it a baby or is it a ficus? All right, you're welcome. Uh, also, this is a draby, not a ficus. I really was hoping that was going to be baby versus ficus. Uh, Who would win in a fight? Yeah, no fighting. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, dang it. All right. Last lightning talk of the day, or not of the day. No, we got a bunch more. No, we got a bunch more. I lied. Anyway, up next, we got Kate with, with your lightning talk whenever you are ready. All right, so this is a, I'm Kate Dybul again. I had promised I was not gonna present this, but a lot of people were asking about this from my talk yesterday on inclusive alt text. So I'm gonna be talking about the speaker alt text on the uh, speaker page for the conference. So I just wanna first mention a quick privilege recognition that I failed to make yesterday. I should have said yesterday that as a sighted person, I needed to recognize that because I am cited, I'm not necessarily uh, the only person who should be speaking about alt text. Particularly, ultimately, we also need to make sure that the ultimate users of alt text, uh, blind and low vision people, uh, people who are blind or have low vision, uh, you know, their voices matter as well. So you might have noticed on the speakers page that if you click on any individual speaker, you will actually get a little, uh, you know, you'll get their like little highlighted biography and everything. But you also get a description of what the image looks like. So in the example for me, it says cartoon avatar of a quite pale, white, bespectacled brunette geek girl whose open downturned mouth is adamantly advocating an important point or three. It's a great description of me. A bookcase is behind her. So this was added and it is semi-related to my talk. So this was also inspired by that certain blog post that had the comment about race and alt text that I really hated, but I really liked what it was talking about, about speaker pages. It was actually talking about headshots for a conference. And I was thinking like, hey, maybe we should do better on our speaker page for Code for Live. I was planning on being the head of the accessibility committee again. So let's go ahead and do that. And I thought like, yeah, let's just do this. And I thought maybe make the text visible too, because Twitter had talked about starting to do that. So, and if you're curious on how we gathered the descriptive text, I'll share this in the Slack app afterwards. And these slides are already up in the OSF, but we provided them with a page that had instructions and a form. 
And the instructions were pretty much, you know, these are sort of a reordered version of them. There are things in there like if this fourth one talks about emotion matters, which was directly inspired by that particular blog. By the way, I haven't linked to that blog because I don't. It's just that little racial thing. It's one of those where I do not want to link to it. It annoys me. I also don't want to send people targeting the person. It is a relatively decent blog afterwards. But there were two instructions related to um, identity. So I talked about, you know, ethnicity, race, gender, visual disabilities, and kind of on how to describe them. I will say that the instructions I gave were a little contrary to some of how I started feeling after writing yesterday's talk, where I didn't mention gender performance and skin tone, because that's what the standard is right now. Now, I want to be clear on a few things here. I was never going to analyze the alt text uh, for my talk. One, I was not going to have the time for that. Two, it's, it's weird. Like these things sort of started separately. I got engaged in a lot more talks about diversity and inclusion in alt text. That made me think, I really want to write a talk about this. And here's the other thing. I am a real strickler when it comes to research ethics and proper par participant consent. Uh, I have been called uh, the IRB bitch before. I'm usually known as the accessibility bitch. You know, I hope that I'm still PG-13. But yeah, I, I'm really big with this. If I ever actually wanted to analyze these alt texts, I would contact every uh, individual and ask for their permission. So that's something I just want to make clear there. But what did I really think about them? Well, first of all, I was super pleased with the turnout. Everyone who submitted a picture included a description. Of course, the description field was required. That's a great way to get a good response rate. <laughs> the descriptions were quite varied, and but also the photos were not necessarily always of people. That's something we might want to consider. Although I'm scared that might mean we have to have real photos, and I hate my, my getting my photograph taken, so I use an avatar. But we did have to insist that the uh, community support uh, squad volunteers did have pictures of themselves so we could actually recognize them in person. But really, I'm just thankful for everyone who participated in it. It was just, it was a little bit of an experiment just in going like, hey, what happens? And I would love to hear feedback from any, any people in here, particularly if you're an assistive technology user and you appreciated it, but just in general, I hope that it worked out well. And again, like you can always ask me accessibility questions. Thank you, thank you. We don't have a name for the next one, but it's about robots and outreach. And if that's you, you might want to come down here. <laughs> We are rolling, we are keeping time, we are gonna go fast, talk and roll, talk and roll. All right. All right, well, that's like my 12th newbie mistake. Hi, I'm Joa Tang. I'm a new uh, Code for Liber. Um, I hail from Tompkins County Public Library in the Finger Lakes Library System. And my job is library assistant for youth services, teen services, and makerspace. So I'm cross-departmental. And my main job is to provide STEM programming for youth and to teach coding. And one thing I wanted to present to you today is a great tool if you ever decide to want to volunteer for a public library and do a coding club for kids. It's very rewarding. And if kids see librarians who code, it'll blow their mind. Like the kids that I work with want to be librarians, but they also want to make the next Mario game. But when they find out that you can code in a library, it, it will blow their minds. So that's the second part of my talk is a call for volunteers. So what I want to show you today is kind of a live um, demonstration of this tool called mBlock. It is an open sourced version of Scratch from MIT. Um, I think I got that right. Anyways, <laughs> it gives you plugins so that you can attach Arduinos. Anyone here a maker or use Adafruit or Raspberry Pis? All right, I see a few makers. 
This allows you to use the Scratch language to program your Arduino or any um, microcontroller that you can think of. There's quite a few in this list. There's even some proprietary ones like, uh, let's see, the Kodi up there. So what we do with this is it allows us to teach the fundamentals of coding logic to kids, but without confusing them. Because if we use Arduino, does anyone know what Arduino's language is? If, for those of you who don't, it's in C. So presenting that to a six-year-old, uh, they're like, this is really cool. And then five minutes later, like, I want to go home. It's too much text to write. <laughs> I don't want to type anymore <laughs> while they're texting their friends. But I digress. <laughs> So let me just show you quickly how these tools work, and then I'll show you uh, what we've been using. So if we want to say we want to use an Arduino Uno, we just simply select it. And while it loads, if I run out of time, we'll let it just load. Anyways, it gives you blocks that allow you to access the pins and some of the functions that you'd find in the Arduino C library. So as you can see there, here are a few of those uh, pre-made functions for you. For example, we can suspend a pin, we can set a digital pin, and we can crank the robot's motor speed up using PWM, which um, find me afterwards if you want to know more about this. So this is what we use to um, program our robots at our library. Uh, let me go to the next share. Let's see here. Yes. Also, our library has TikTok because that's the only way we can communicate with our teens. Yes, and we're all hams where we come from. So, um, but this is a really fun collaboration we did. And this is where I would like to ask you all, if you ever have time or wanna work with kids, come to a public library and volunteer because we need coders, we need kids to see themselves. And I see a lot of you around and I see a lot of my kids in you. So it's really important that you, um, or that we give kids opportunities to see themselves in STEM fields. So this is an awesome collaboration between our local robotics club, Code Red, uh, Cornell's entomology department and our library. We created a laser cut. Whoop. Nope, that's the teen center. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what we did is we presented them the challenge to use a laser cutter using vector software and them to sit down with the entomologist and figure out how insects walk and wrestle each other. And they spent an entire week and we served about 30 different youths from different backgrounds. And that is what we can provide when we all collaborate um, between universities, public libraries and local clubs. So thank you. If you're interested, see me afterwards. That is the boldest talk we've had. <laughs> All right, up next, I'm not going back up there because we don't have time. We are talking, we are rolling. We are going with Ken. You ready, Ken?
All right, are we good? All right. Um, so this is a, a, you already know these lessons, but it's always good to have a reminder of them kind of talk with a little hometown connection. I was reminded the other day that Ani DeFranco is from Buffalo and um, every lesson I learn can be tied to an Ani lyric. And this is a frequent one. If you don't ask the right questions, every answer feels wrong. And so I had a colleague come to me a week or so ago with a pile of data that needed to be cleaned. Oops. Uh, these are probably kinds of data that you have seen before. Some, some somewhat crufty, uh, we, we just need the titles, but the title string in the 245 field contains a whole bunch of other stuff that it doesn't need. And uh, so she handed me this pile of data and said, I just want the titles. And of course you can see some of them are delimited with a slash, something like 85% of them are delimited with a slash. Uh, you get some with the by, and then you get made by, and then we other had other ones that were like, you know, written and illustrated by. And so it was, it was tricky to just um, extract the title from that. And so I thought, well, I know what to do with this. This is a pile of regexes waiting to happen. And so it, I, I did that and it took an hour or two and I refined them and came up with new ones. And after a couple hours, I had like 99 and a half percent of the, of the data was coming out looking more or less the way it was supposed to. Um, I thought, oh, we need, we need a way to share this with our librarians. I need to you know, make this easy for them. I'll, I'll work up a little thing to build into uh, Google Sheets. And, but I thought, what about that last half a percent? Can we do better? Can we write a machine learning thing to understand what needs to happen? Um, and I was, I was coming to Code for Lib with this question in my head and I was thinking, who should I ask about this? In fact, I asked somebody yesterday who I should ask about it. I never got around to doing it. Um, and it turns out the answer, as I discovered at four o'clock this morning when I couldn't sleep, was that the 245 field already has these delimiters built in. Um, so that, that first gross thing where the author's name is actually part of a string uh, in, the, in the mark field, the C subfield has the, the author separate. And all you got to do is take the A field and the B field and put them together. But that wasn't the data that was coming to me. So I didn't think of that problem. If I had gone back to the librarian and said, hey, let's export that data again in a different shape, it would have been a, a 30 second problem. Uh, and instead it was a three hour problem. So I was feeling very proud of my regular expression usage. It was very fun. I'm not sad that I did that, but there were smarter ways to do it. And so I, I was reminded again this morning that sometimes the simple way is not the way that occurs to us. And so I was asking the wrong question. I got the wrong answer and until the wee hours this morning. So insomnia is good for something, I guess. So that's what I wanted to share with you. All right, thank you, thank you. We got another talk coming up. I forgot what it's about. <laughs> Dan, Chuck, and Kelsey, come on down. I was hoping with more energy, y'all. <laughs> thank you. Take it away. Hello, that worked. Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. All right, we're going to talk about product management for libraries, or as the slide says, product management for libraries. Uh, so quick show of hands, how many of you work at a library with a product manager? Cool, that's awesome. Okay, 
Um, so quick introduction. Uh, we work for uh, Ad Hoc, it's a digital services firm uh, that was started by the people who uh, rescued healthcare.gov. Uh, today, our mission is to make government experiences excellent. Uh, we, our company works with VA, CMS, GSA, OP OPM, uh, the Library of Congress, which is sort of why we're here, uh, and more. Um, and we've worked at private companies, public sector institutions, nonprofits, and of course, libraries. So that's kind of the experience we're bringing to this. Uh, and it's the first code for lib for 66% of us. Uh, I'm new, Kelsey is new, uh, Chuck is a veteran. Um, so to start, what is product management? Um, we wanna talk about some problems in technology, right? So one problem is that it's really, really hard to build the right thing, even in the best uh, software firms on earth, the literature is filled with reports of failure. Um, the, part of the reason that's true is that putting yourself in the shoes of your customer is really hard. There's scholarly research that says that the more you try to sit there and think about what your customers, your users, your patrons want, the worse you get at it. And the punchline is without rapid user-driven feedback loops, it's easy for institutions to focus on this stuff instead of delivering strategic value, deliver, doing valuable things. Um, enter product management, right? So product management is a function that helps organizations build the right things they do that by focusing on user needs and working with product teams, TLDR, they bridge strategy and delivery. Um, but for reasons, this is hard. So most of the product management literature out there is written for for-profit uh, businesses and not for libraries or public sector institutions. Defining business value in a for-profit business is really easy. Are you making more money or are you not? Defining business value in a library or in a government uh, organization is hard because um, sometimes you can't pivot because your mission, your library's mission is defined by law or defined by your charter or whatever. Uh, you typically will have longer term institutional goals rather than short term quarterly results to report. Um, you also have a responsibility for equity rather than profit maximization. So you may spend time targeting underserved populations explicitly, even though you know that's a small percentage of your overall user base, but you care about that um, underserved population. So uh, not only is knowing what value is hard, but also measuring that value is even harder because most of the things that libraries care about can't be directly measured. So you have to come up with proxy metrics that are at best imperfect. And that requires a lot of time and a lot of hard thought. Um, the good news is that as a developer, I'm an infrastructure engineer. Um, you know, I am not trained in this, but there are people who are trained in this and they're called product managers. So, how might product management work in libraries? We had a talk yesterday on um, patron-driven development. He was thinking absolutely rightly, start by talking to your users, but don't go to them for answers, go to them for problems, figure out what the problems are, think about how you might solve those problems, and then come up with bets. We bet if we do this, it will solve this problem. And here's how we know whether it will or it won't. You have to define your metrics so you know what you're measuring um, and then try it and understand that a lot of them will fail. Um, also, what should we be working on? Are we wasting our time working on this? Is this in line with what our library cares about? Prioritization, libraries and public institutions often have many stakeholders with competing priorities. Developers should not be wasting precious cycles competing about that. You know, just because something is urgent doesn't mean it's important. Just because it's something's important doesn't mean it's urgent. Sussing that out is really important for knowing you are working as effectively as you can. Maintain a reach, uh, research backlog. This is a great place. Are you all familiar with the term hippo? Highest paid person's opinion. Okay. So when they come to you and say, we need to work on that, you say, great, we'll put it in the backlog and we'll prioritize it in our next planning. You know, And the beauty of it is if you have a product manager, they get to do that and not you. All right, so um, what, would, what would an actual product manager do? Start by talking to library stakeholders, come to the tech staff, talk to them about solutioning, and then you design the experiments and you iterate and you do it over and over and over. And this is how we effectively make sure we're building the right things and not wasting those developer 
cycles, which are so precious and none of us have enough of. We got one more. <laughs> Eric P. Where? I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> Give it up for Eric P. Is the string shared? Uh, not yet. Go, go, nice, go. Nice, nice, nice. Oops. Wait, that does it? There you go. All right. Microphone. Yes. Very quickly, uh, inspired by some of the terrible data we've already seen, like in Julie, Julia Caffrey Hill's talk, I wanted to share some repositories or just examples I've seen. This kind of inspired me. There was this pretty old Mark Thulu example. It's not actually that well maintained. It has like two examples, but here's one of them, pretty tame, a 260 field missing the indicators. That's not like anything wild. Um, a thing that I've seen in an API response is uh, this lovely data where like, instead of having actual Booleans, they have not only a text field, but a text field put into an array. So that's pretty cool. And then to top it off, the naming convention is inconsistent where like the is is sometimes capitalized and sometimes not. That really just upsets me deeply. Um, but then this is a field in an ILS migration that I had to do where, this was the only way that holds data was stored in this string where three different identifiers for the patron, the hold and the item are all like written in there. We had to, we literally just didn't know what the dates meant. We had to figure out it was not needed by NMB date place. I had to parse this in Python and like split up the string and, and cast everything into actual meaningful information. So that's just really awful lot. Let's give it up to all of our lightning talk participants for today. And for putting up with our sheer chaos of the day. Hello. Now that we have calmed down and we can get back to being a bit serious, let us start with our talks. Group five talks. On Zoom, we have Naomi Duche and Mike Giarlo with Avoiding Unconscious Bias, a Defined Hiring Process. Naomi and Mike, can you hear us? Yep. yep. All right, y'all ready? Yep. Yep. So today we're talking about avoiding unconscious bias and hopefully you can see this great. Um, and we put this in use recently in uh, doing some hiring. Um, we'll be talking about that. Um, first thing to note is that we are all biased. Um, the, uh, there's no question that everyone has biases. Um, we have lots of unconscious biases and Sometimes we have conscious biases, biases, and sometimes uh, we make our biases conscious to ourselves. Um, oops, there we go. Um, so really a better, better title for this talk would be about reducing unconscious bias because it's, we're not gonna be able to eliminate it. Um, so how does bias affect the workplace? Well, uh, definitely affects hiring decisions. It affects promotion decisions. It affects salary and raise decisions. It affects work assignment decisions, probably affects any decisions involving choosing among people. Um, so how do, we, how do we attack this? Well, one way 
to do it is to think about our own individual biases. Um, how can we reduce them? Uh, these are all just uh, a, a, a grab bag of, of ways to go about it, to try to learn what unconscious biases are in the first place, to try to figure out what your own unconscious biases likely are. There is a, a tool that Harvard puts out, the implicit association test. Um, you know, I'm not sure that's the be all and end all, but it's something. Um, we can use data to make decisions. Uh, we can work hard at diversifying the people involved in making decisions. So more than one viewpoint is present. And we can also hold ourselves accountable. With that, I turn it over to Mike. Okay, thank you, Naomi. So to set the stage in 2021, the team that Naomi and I are on posted two new software developer positions, and we hadn't hired new staff on our team in a few years. We considered this an opportunity not only to expand our team, but also to improve our hiring process with a focus on reducing bias. Naomi and I co-led the process with our boss's blessing. Fortunately, we were uh, next, Thank you. Fortunately, we were aware of recent advancements in this area. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge the work of Jeremy Friesen, a software developer formerly at Notre Dame and a former Sanvera board member who designed the hiring process we're talking about today. Second, I'll acknowledge the Sanvera open source community for using this hiring process to hire their first community manager position in 2020. And last, I want to acknowledge our Stanford colleagues, Hannah Frost and Mark Marienzo, who adopted and used this very same process within our department prior to our team picking it up. Next. There's not nearly enough time to do a deep dive into the hiring process, unfortunately, so I will focus instead on the aspects of the process that help reduce bias. And at the end, we'll link to some materials and provide our contact information if you want to dig in further. Next. Okay, so I'm going to be saying the word KSAs many times, so let me define the term. KSAs are the set of knowledge, skills, and abilities required to successfully perform the functions of a job, the hiring criteria. The entire hiring process is rooted in these KSAs. They're set early on in the process with KSAs being drafted alongside writing the job description, or they may come with the job description depending on how your HR department works. This was the case for us, as you can see here. Making KSAs the centerpiece of your hiring process is important because they help to base decisions on actual success factors for the person you hire, not extraneous characteristics that could more easily be tainted by bias. Next. Before we go further, here's a high level glimpse into how selection works in this hiring process. After the first consideration date of the posting has passed, the first selection or pre-screen occurs with the hiring team deciding which candidates move forward to a brief screening interview. After screening interviews have been held, the second selection or screen occurs with the hiring team deciding which candidates move forward to a longer form interview. And after all longer form interviews have been held, the third selection occurs. At this point, what happens largely depends on how your institution works. You may immediately proceed to making an offer, or maybe the scores will go up to a supervisor before an offer is extended. Next. The initial selection, the pre-screen, is determined based on the candidate's fit to KSAs, based on their applic application materials, and whether they satisfy other requirements of the job, such as years of experience or education. All remaining assessment in the process though is entirely based on fit to KSAs with every member of the hiring team scoring each candidate on each KSA. Before they see any applications or any selection occurs, the hiring team assigns weights to the KSAs, which you can see in this image. These weights are a reflection of which KSAs are more important or more central to the work of the position. Each hiring team member gets to decide their own weights with a limited pool of points to assign, and then the weights are averaged out, so it is a purely group decision. These weights are used later in the screen and interview spreadsheets as a multiplier to boost candidates who do well in the KSAs that have higher weights. Next. Another feature of the initial selection, the pre-screen, is that cover letters and CVs are partially redacted. Not only do we redact the candidate's personal name, but also their pronouns, graduation and job dates, 
contact information, reference names, visa status, and institution names. And why do we do this? Well, because information about the candidate's identity, ethnicity, gender, age, et cetera, is more likely to run afoul of bias. And we want to evaluate candidates based only on their fit to the job and filter out all the less relevant information. Next. Every selection step of the process is done by a group of people, all of whose scores are equally considered. Here you can see the spreadsheet used for the screening step of the process. Leveraging group-based decision-making can help reduce bias by encompassing different perspectives, even more so if the group has some measure of diversity. More on this later. Using this spreadsheet um, as a, the official record of how candidates are scored shows that hiring decisions are both group-based and data-based. And we felt that this helped us make a stronger case for our final candidate rankings. And incidentally, the team is really happy with both the results of this search and how, the, how well the process worked for our team. Throughout the process, no one voice is privileged over any other. Everyone's voice has equal weight and impact, helping to counteract personal bias. Next, please. For each of the three selection steps of the process, scoring is done asynchronously. Everyone gets to choose their own scores. After the team has completed all scoring, the team meets to discuss and optionally change their scores before moving on to the next step of the process. Adjusting scores is entirely optional though, um, but we found it was a good way to learn more about how the rest of the team is thinking about both the candidates and the KSAs, helping to see each other, see blind spots. And this is a means to discover and counteract one's own biases. Next. After the pre-screen, written screening questions are emailed to each candidate and they are asked to submit written responses in advance of their screening call. Further showing the importance of the KSAs to the process, before they're sent out, the written questions are mapped to KSAs to ensure the brief 30 minute screening call elicits enough information for the hiring team to score the candidates on how well they fit the requirements of the job. With the candidate's written responses in hand, we can use the screening call with each candidate to drill even deeper into their responses to gain greater insight into their knowledge, skills, and abilities. Using written questions, make sure the hiring team asks the same question of all candidates, pu putting them all on equal footing. So these asynchronous components of the process are valuable also in reducing bias against, for instance, introverted candidates giving all candidates the opportunity to compose their answers in advance helps even the playing field. Next. There are other parts of hiring that are ripe for reducing bias. For example, how you write a job description, word choices that you make, gender neutral language, et cetera, and where you post your job description. To wrap, though, to wrap up though, I want to offer an observation that may strike you as rather obvious, but I think it's one that bears saying. The constitution of the hiring team, specifically the diversity thereof, is important to consider before starting the hiring process. All of us have different biases based on who we are, how and where and when we were raised, and so on. A diverse hiring team can help dampen the impact of any particular bias. Of course, hiring is the, only the first hurdle when adding new team members. And next, Naomi is going to talk about onboarding. Next. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we included this section because uh, with the pandemic and everything going on, remote onboarding became uh, something that a lot of us were doing and are still doing. And uh, it's, it's something to grapple with. So our particular goals for onboarding our new hires are to make them feel welcome, included as a team member, to help them become productive as soon as possible, um, developers generally like to code and having them be able to do that quickly uh, tends to make them feel more comfortable. And also we have an unusually large team at Stanford uh, in, our, in our group. And um, that means we have certain team processes that we want folks to be comfortable with. Um, so our normal pre-pandemic approach was to have the, the, for the uh, new hires be on site with the whole team. Um, for the first two weeks, but with travel being a problem in the pandemic, that had to be scrapped. Um, we also had and still have the practice of assigning an individual mentor to each new hire. 
and having the mentors make their the hires their priority for their first week or two. Um, we also took every opportunity to emphasize that everyone on the team was happy to answer questions or give guidance or whatever was needed. So our first problem is that our both of our new hires were in the Eastern time zone. And of course, Stanford is in the Pacific time zone and both mentors happen to be in the Pacific time zone and there was not gonna be any in-person um, mentoring. Uh, so how do we handle this? Well, we were lucky that we had uh, a person already in the Eastern time zone. So that person uh, graciously agreed to mentor uh, before the uh, West Coast folks were up and at work. Um, we also deliberately put in a, a daily social social Zoom um, with icebreakers, just as a means of getting conversation flowing for the first two weeks of the hire so that they could have a, a little bit more informal time with, with um, the team members. And we also tried to add some icebreakers to our regular meetings if time permitted. And the icebreakers were often um, carefully chosen to not, not make people uncomfortable. We said anyone could skip if they wanted to and not and not participate. And they were often things like, you know, um, what was your first programming job or something like that. So so everyone could have something to say, uh, et cetera. So as far as the second goal went for onboarding, um, we we wanted our hires to become productive quickly, um, particularly. It, it was an objective to try to get them to contribute some, some form of code or documentation change or anything in the first week, preferably code. Um, so how do we do this? Well, um, we made a rather extensive uh, list of things that needed to be done for the new hire in terms of goals and um, how, to, how to get the background in order to achieve the goals. And we split the checklist into, excuse me, into um, these time blocks. So the first day, first week, the second week, the third week, and then the first three months. And I would, I would say that in reality, we probably followed it more or paid more attention to it for maybe two or three weeks. And then it sort of faded as not as necessary. Um, the checklist also had a section of what to do before the new hire started, because there's always all kinds of, of preparations and making sure that we got them all done was uh, important. I guess that could have been on a separate checklist. It just didn't happen to be that way for us. Um, so here's another challenge we hit with helping our new hires become productive. This is our new simplified chart of all our apps and how they interact. Isn't that awesome? Um, and like who the heck can like come into this and start being productive with all these interrelationships. So um, what happened is we prepared a, a little bit of a curriculum of, of ordering how to learn this architecture so that they didn't get completely lost having to learn, you know, 30 some apps uh, all at once. Um, and in trying to create this curriculum, and running it by uh, existing team members, uh, most of them said, gosh, I wish I had had this curriculum when I started. So for us with our complexities, that was a really big thing. I don't know how much that applies to the rest of you. Um, so uh, to kind of review the becoming productive part of, of remote onboarding, we have the mentors, we have the we tried to get the whole team to identify coding tasks for the new hires when we when we bumped into them. And we tried to make sure the mentors really stayed on track of trying to help their, their mentees, as it were, uh, submit some code for review because we, we are a shop that uses GitHub with um, pull requests and code review. So our third goal was about trying to learn how our team works and um, we use an agile approach at our team in, at Stanford that is really highly adapted to our particular needs. It's not pure agile if such a thing exists. Um, but there's a there's a way that our work flows and certain artifacts that we tend to use. And so um, the new hires in particular were very curious to like see how all of this was going to work 
and and yes, you know, we showed them things and explained it, but really the main way to learn a lot of this stuff is to jump in and just again keep emphasizing that everyone on the team is is invested and interested in making this a positive experience and getting the new folks to be productive. So um, that ends the presentation part of our talk. We're happy to take questions. Thank you. Oh, good. Okay. While we are doing some technical updates right now, let me distract you <laughs> with a fun little discussion here. Did you know? that one of the main cuisines from Buffalo and one that is very much not known is not the Buffalo wing, but the humble pizza log. Someone knows, yeah, the pizza log. So the pizza log, if you have not encountered the very humble pizza log, imagine an egg roll, but instead of the usual stuffings in an egg roll, it is cheese, it is marinara, and pepperonis, the humble pizza log. If you have not had one yet, may I suggest you do so before you leave our humble city. I also recommend the Loganberry drink, but that is because I have a palate of a five-year-old. Okay, now that I have distracted you enough. <laughs> so we have our next talk, hopefully, Oh God. Yeah, Rachel Evans and Jason Tubinis with Cracking the Communication Code, Tools and Strategies for Savvy Project Management. Rachel and Jason, are you around? Can you hear us? We are around. Yay! Also, want to give you a huge, huge props for getting my last name correct. <laughs> Take it away. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cracking the Communication Code, Tools and Strategies for Savvy Project Management. You just heard that title, but you now you've heard it a second time in my crazy voice. Uh, my name is Jason Tabinis. I am the Information Technology Librarian at the University of Georgia. I am also a... I am originally from Buffalo, New York, grew up, born and raised in East Aurora, uh, went to school at UB for uh, law school and for a uh, library school. So wish I could come home. Um, actually, I'm going to be home in about a month. So really looking forward to snacking on some Mighty Taco and some Loganberry. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. And I'm Rachel Evans. Um, Jason and I are both presenting virtually from University of Georgia in Law Library in Athens, Georgia. We are literally through the wall with each other here, zooming into you uh, in Buffalo. Um, I'm the Metadata Services and Special Collections Librarian here at UGA Law. And a lot of what we're going to talk to you about today is from our experience working together on our library systems team. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Jason. So our, the, we want to kind of um, have a little bit of an icebreaker. And I know that, you know, uh, getting some feedback from the audience is going to be a little challenging. Um, but so I'll just kind of move through that. Um, that'll be the in, uh, icebreaker. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the platforms that we use and then some um, best practices and key takeaways. So. 
when I'm thinking of the icebreaker and are your wires crossed, are you communicating? I thought this would be a fun little way to check your competency in some of the new uh, shorthand that has kind of percolated up into the digital landscape. Some of these are very interesting. Some of these are completely ridiculous. Some of them are really not obvious and some of them kind of demonstrate that even if you're not a digital native, some things just kind of transcend. So let's go with this one. And I feel like this, this one has some interesting connotations. You see this emoji a lot these days. And I, whenever I saw this, I was like, oh, this is dark. Why is this showing up everywhere? Uh, see, um, are people just watching the news a lot? Well, yes. But anybody, I don't know, is, is there a way to get some uh, feedback audi from the audience? It's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> you see this a lot when um, when people are, this is the new LOL emoji. You know, usually it's the laughing, crying. This is like so funny, I die laughing. Like, oh, you know, yeah, I'm sure you've heard like somebody laughs so much like, oh, I'm dead. It, it, it's, it's dark, it's morbid, it's very Zoomer, very millennial. This one is my favorite, all goat, no cap. Because I saw this transact, this um, kind of communication kind of show up uh, in a Reddit thread. I'm like, and then the person who kind of had to correct everyone was like, man, I'm 40 and I know what this means. I'm like, uh oh, I'm losing the thread. So GOAT actually is an acronym in this, in this scenario. It stands for greatest of all time. No cap means... No lie. And there is an entire history behind how no cap means not lying. You're all librarians. You know how Google works. Trust me, I'm not sending you down a crazy, gross um, internet, you know, perfuffle. It actually, there's some really interesting history behind this. Just trust me, when someone says all goat, no cap, it means no lie. That's awesome. This one, I mean, it's the okay symbol, right? And then 4chan got a hold of it. And now it's either the okay sign or shorthand for the 14 words. Depends on who you ask. I don't use this one anymore because 99% of the people know that it's the okay symbol. But really, I'm not gonna take a chance with that 1%. This one shows up, th this is a fun little acronym, like, hey, that's a really nice PFP. Oh man, where'd you get yours? I'm like, uh, um, did you mean PHP? That's really solid code. No, this is profile picture. And it also, this one gets kind of tied up in the whole NFT discussion. Like, oh, like your, your PFP is an NFT, LOL. Okay. <laughs> ah, I got Rachel to laugh. That was the goal. <laughs> and this is one I feel like transcends whether you understand, whether you're familiar with the source of this GIF. Did I say that right? GIF, GIF, whatever. Uh, you don't need to know where this came from. You don't need to even care about who these people are. This is what you see in a Discord or a Slack where like, I've been away at lunch and then I see this and like, oh, something went off the rails. So sometimes you don't need to be completely plugged into internet culture 24 seven to just know like, ah, I've walked into a very interesting situation. These were awesome. Thank you, Jason, for uh, those amazing icebreakers. I remember when you and I were first talking about the like no uh, the goat and the cap. I was like goatee, like I was trying to figure it out, and I <laughs> and I I myself get caught up in like oh no, I used the wrong thing to talk about the the right thing, and how do I you know how do I do that with coworkers? Um, obviously there's a part of the equation that is sort of generational boundaries. There's also, you know, to compound the issue, um, ever since the pandemic first began and continuing to now, we, a lot of us, even if we weren't using some of these channels before we've onboarded them for our entire library or our whole organization. And so now it's a lot more common for us to actually be doing that sort of communication back and forth 
with tools that we weren't really originally onboarded for and that many of us, um, particularly some of our coworkers who are crossing lots of generational boundaries, we are not um, used to doing this with each other. We may not be speaking the same languages. We may not understand the same lingo or like use the same reactions for the same sorts of situations. And there can be a lot of miscommunication and it can cause a lot of um, a lot of stress and just add to you know these issues that we already have so um, one of the things that i want to talk about that i think is sort of key to understanding why it's so important to have good communication on your teams particularly when you're doing sort of highly technical work in a library setting um, is to think about the makeup and the number of the people on your teams and so that's really what this section is on um, i got to give credit it's on the slide but i want to make sure i mention it out loud about a year ago i went to um, the innovative users group conference and that was where i saw a fantastic presentation by trevor smith um, this librarian introduced this formula to me for the first time and was also talking about similar things that other people talked about earlier today as well, sort of project management approaches to traditional library, particularly like systems and technical services situations um, and, and large scale projects. So what we're looking at right now is a formula. It's in N minus one, two, Take that and figure out what is the actual number of channels any given team would have. And I'm going to give you examples of this based on what Jason and I um, have been working with in our own library. So you can actually see what I'm talking about. So you can see the formula here at the top again. N is the number of people. Um, here is an excellent equation. And when I first heard about this last summer, I was thinking, no wonder it's so much easier for me to work with my um, my very small teams. Our systems team is a great example that consists of Jason and I's supervisor, who's the head of collection services, um, and ourselves. And so our three person team is really good at communicating. Um, is that just the makeup of the people? I mean, that's obviously a part of the puzzle, sort of our personalities, our communication styles, how long we've known each other, those sorts of things. But another factor is just the number of people. You can see from the diagram, there are only three possible communication channels between three people. So the um, the odds of signals getting crossed and misunderstood um, is much lower because there's only three of us. So let's look again, our instruction team. This is a team that Jason leads and myself and four other librarians are part of this team. Um, that team's a little more tricky. Sometimes it's, it's a lot harder to figure out which of our communication channels, be it email, uh, Slack, um, just like stopping by someone's office, calling them on the phone. There's so many different things that we could use to share information with each other and deciding what to do or how to respond or how quickly to respond can be really difficult on that team. Because even though it sounds like there's only five people, the number of channels goes up to 10. Um, that's a big number of channels for lines to get crossed between individuals. And now the final example I wanna look at, um, we have 10 librarians at our library and you say, well, it's pretty small, right? Um, sounds pretty small, maybe compared to some of you out there where you are at a larger library. And um, we are at a small law library, although our larger institution has bigger libraries. So we do too. We feel like we're a pretty small library, but the number of channels between the 10 of us can get up to 45. That's a lot of, of layers of miscommunication that are potential. Um, one more, uh, just to give you some good visuals to think about this equation and how it might relate to you and your library. Um, this really helped me again, credit to these diagrams from Trevor. Um, here we have the number of people next to the number of signals that would come from that number of people. So if you're in an organization and there's 30 people who are trying to communicate and work together, your number of signals could be 435. I mean, that is, that is crazy big. And so it's no wonder when you think about that on top of the mixture of the variety of platforms that we're using to communicate with each other, on top of the generational barriers and sort of using different languages with one another, how difficult this can be. So how can we uh, prevent 
this sort of miscommunication and how can we use technology um, or savvy project management to help manage this and maybe mitigate problems before they happen um, so that we can be more effective in the workplace. And that's where I'm going to um, shift it over to Jason. We are actually going to talk about some of the tools that we use and our favorite tools. Um, it would be wonderful if we could just do without some. I know one book that I just want to give a plug for is Cal Newport's World Without Email. Um, it would be a dream, right? Some of us, maybe we feel that way. Um, others may say, no, you'll never take my email. Um, but I encourage you to read that even if you're maybe just considering like what are some of the other tools out there. Um, there's a lot of good info in there. And so first up, synchronous virtual meetings. I think we are all intimately aware, aware of how these work and uh, what some of our options are. Obviously, Zoom is right up there. Um, Teams, uh, JabberMe, there's a, there is a, there are a lot of video conferencing options available out there. And this, I feel like most people understand this, this kind of fills in this, it's a, it's more than a phone call. It's a little less than an in-person meeting. It's, it, it requires a little bit more, um, setup and um, coordination they are not you mean you need to have all the people who are participating being able to log in somehow unfortunately enough there's a lot of different ways you can dial in you can use your phone you can use uh, a desktop computer laptop these are I don't think there's a lot to be going on but I want to say that this is one of the many tools you have in your toolbox that but it, it, it and I want to kind of caution against and I think you know you know, two years of pandemic have kind of taught us that Zoom or synchronous virtual meetings are fantastic for some things and simply do not work for others. Um, but don't let a really good or really bad experience kind of turn you off from or to or use them in use them in moderation. Use them where is like, yeah, we we need to get a couple people and just you know hash this out. The uh, asynchronous and synchronous chats, um, I'm a big fan of these, you know, going back to AOL or IRC days, just having a place to drop in, linger, passively observe chat, take, take, um, take part in when you can, and then just have something in the background. I just I love, you know, in the run, in, you know, 2018, 2019, we, one of our librarians says, we need a Slack. And like, no one thought this was a good idea. We tried a couple times. And then suddenly when everyone's just chilling in their jammy bottoms in their living room, trying to get work done, having a common area is perfect. So these are fantastic tools. You can drop in, you can take, you can just sit and linger in a channel. You can leave, come back, show up. Um, what happens, what can be real issue is like, I have a really urgent issue that needs to be addressed and I'm going to try to get a hold of somebody on Slack or um, Teams or something like that. It can be challenging. Um, but if you just want to have like, here's something you should be aware of. Like, has it, what are people thinking about this generally? Let's get prepared for this meeting. Very useful in that regard. So it, it's a nice middle ground. And um, I'm going to transition over to uh, asynchronous shared task management. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. There's a lot of tools out there. Um, some of the more popular ones, Trello, that's actually one that we were using pretty heavily during the pandemic. And in a second, I'm going to show another example of how we're using that um, as a part of our systems team still for like a longer term, large scale project and to manage the tasks and sort of keep track of things and keep everybody in the loop. Um, but there's also some others I just want to note, you know, there's a sauna that's a really popular one. Airtable is also making a really big um, splash out there. So if you're looking for different tools, if you've never used any of these types of tools outside of like the Zoom that you're experiencing now and that we, you've probably been using for a really long time, I really encourage you just to, you know, check it out. Um, it can really help to give some more structure and have sort of a home base. And I love that this particular tool really allows us to have almost like a soft intranet when we have a big project working and everyone can access it from anywhere at any time. Rachel, can you hear me? I can. 
I, I'm going to have you guys wrap up so that way we don't go too far over time. Okay. By all means. Um, Why don't you get to the last slide? Yeah, let me go, go all the way. So the last thing we were going to show are our, um, yep. we're going to show a racy chart. And this is just to give you some structure for what we've been talking about. Identify which task and which project each person on a given team is going to be responsible for. So you have someone who's responsible, accountable, uh, consulted, and informed. And this just gives you some structure. And maybe each person has a preferred tool, which is some of the tools that we've been talking about. And that way you know exactly when and where to talk about each of the items or to give updates to which person. And that way you're not getting like constant pings on Slack when that person prefers email or when somebody needs to be informed that's maybe at a higher level in the organization. Our slides are available. So feel free to revisit those that I just went through really rapidly. And we wanna leave you with uh, the matrix, the racy matrix, uh, it's everywhere even now in this very room. Thanks for having us, Code for Lib. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Rachel and Jason. That was really great. Uh, all right. So we got one more talk for this bit. Salah Ishmael and Jackie Gosselar with their talk, One Decision at a Time, Remaking Decision-Making for Democratized Technology Projects. Sawa and Jackie, are you here? We are. Great. And thank you so much. And greetings, everyone. Um, Jackie here will be controlling the slides. So if you're here next slide, that's just for Jackie. So we'll introduce ourselves real quickly. There's Jackie Gosselar. Um, next slide. There's Jackie Gosselar. The, um, they go by the pronouns they or she, and they're in charge of coordinating the library system and discovery services and platform. And there's myself, Salva Ismail. My pronouns are she and her. And my portfolio includes um, leadership for digital strategies, including all kinds of innovative and technological infrastructure. Next slide, please. Um, we would like to begin with a land acknowledgement because Berkeley sits in the territory of the uh, Huchun, um, which is the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. And because both Jackie and I are working and presenting from um, the area where um, uh, the Verona band of Alameda County folk um, are, we wanted to put out, we wanted to begin with this land acknowledgement to recognize and um, to recognize and respect indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of the land uh, that we're presenting from and the enduring relationships that still exist between the indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. Next slide, please. So our um, agenda for the session, we know we have 15 minutes. You can already tell I will be talking really fast. Um, we really want to start about what is the process? What was this technology project that we're now trying to emulate with other technology projects that led to the democratized uh, decision making? What was the organizational unlearning that had to happen? It was very interesting, but some of these things were very deeply rooted in how we work from all different hierarchical um, places within the organization. And then Jackie will go into the how of how we did this, and then we'll do a wrap up real quickly. Next slide, please. So um, this may not have been uh, a surprising project for many of, many of the libraries or places that have already moved forward, but folks who don't know, University of California, Berkeley is just one of the 10 campuses within the UC system. We have all of their, we have nine other campuses, including Berkeley. We have two RLFs, which are our regional library facilities. We have one California Digital Library, which is um, a, a, a situated at the Office of the President. And together, all these libraries are part of the University of California library system. However, each campus independent um, works very independently and functions very independently. So up until now, all 10 campuses had different ILS systems, integrated library systems. And even when we had the same platform, we were all using our own version of the platform. It was not working. It, it wasn't something that we had worked on together. For us to move it as a one UC-wide system, 
this was a four year project, which resulted in more than 300,000 UC faculty, students, researchers, clinicians, and staff having access now to 41 million print volumes, which is actually only second in size to the Library of Congress. And the reason it was a four, mil four year project and several million dollars as well was because it needed deep assessment and extensive requirements each library independent or worked very independently and now we had to come together and work as a system. And it was definitely possible these four years due to the hard work of hundreds, and it really is hundreds of library experts across the 10 campuses, the two regional library facilities and the California Digital Library. So what this meant was we were looking to come forward with one unified interface for all UC libraries for our public, enable timely data-driven decisions and position the UC libraries for future innovations as one UC library system. Next slide, please. So what did this mean? This meant we had to unlearn our organizational behavior. It also meant that we had to empower data-driven and consultative decision-making, uh, decision where decisions were only sent up the, as far in the chain as warranted, but no further. And our preference was that the, the, fo the folks were in doing the work were actually the ones who were um, leading from the place they are, which was very much following Senge's principles of um, lead from where you are in a learning organization. We really wanted to be a learning organization. And we wanted to empower our teams and our staff to do this. And in some cases, um, it really was an individual and organizational phenomena. Our organizations not only operated differently on technological platforms, but how we were structured and how different libraries empowered their different um, staffing staff members um, and team members to make decisions, to participate, to even communicate outside of their teams. So um, we actually repeatedly had to reaffirm the shared principle of empowering our staff and our team members. And we actually had to realize that success for us meant relinquishing actually immediate control and coming to an agreement at a shared system-wide level, but also letting our team members know that they had to relinquish the power. They had the power to relinquish the power there for local controls and actually move forward. Um, we tried to listen to the needs of our team members and stakeholders. And a great example of this was while we had a shared governance structure, when issues arose, there was no decision making that came down from top. It was more around a consultative process of let's bring in the team members where there are issues. Let's bring in the colleagues um, where questions are being asked and let's have a discussion and let's have them go back and come up with a solution that they want to propose that they think would be right um, for the organization as we unlearn. There was a little bit of resistance at individual and an organizational level. Um, however, as the project took ground and um, got rooted deeply, people really did feel empowered where we heard from teams, oh, we made that decision and we'll, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, so that for us at the governance structure, we felt ourselves as people who were just keeping the structure going rather than making decisions. So next um, slide, Jackie, please. Thank you. Um, we also wanted to make sure that as we were making these decisions, we kept thinking we are, while we're democratizing, we're letting individuals who are part of these teams make decisions. And individuals who are part of the, the teams weren't just the unit heads or leaders. They were people who had just functional expertise or people who had deep rooted functional expertise um, outside of management structures. And that is actually what we wanted. We wanted people from all different areas to lead. However, it also meant letting people know to honor the past decisions, but it was time for a change in the future. Rather than being bound by our long-standing individual practices, we really did seek to design new practices holistically. Um, maybe our faculty were very comfortable with six months. However, another faculty, campus faculty were very comfortable with 12 months. Well, where could we all come together to have one decision made and create a success that helps us succeed, not just locally, but also at a system level. And what we also wanted to do was instill changes that did not equal retroactively maligning our past decisions. So it really went back to respecting the past, honoring our past, um, but making changes for the future. And with this, I would like to pass on the virtual mic to Jackie. So 
Thank you, Sala. And I'd like to sort of move into the how piece and what empowerment really meant um, for our UCB partners, especially. So we developed the shared governance structure, the Alma Primo VE coordination team, Apricot, which I named and I think was my crowning achievement of the entire implementation. Kidding, um, but that that notion of having a shared government with folks um, to contribute from where they are is a really big piece. And as the chair of that committee, um, as the basically the service manager for Alma and Primo VE, um, it was important to me to sort of think about how to set the stage um, for folks to actually communicate and to empower, to make them feel like they could take ownership over decisions and participate, because I wanted to honor the fact that folks participate in really different ways. Um, and so part of that is investigating group dynamics. So we had a few conversations about what, um, what it means to participate, constructing group norms and values. Um, and part of that was trying to foster open communication and make space for people who communicate in different ways. Um, maybe folks aren't the most comfortable being called out <laughs> in a meeting. Um, and so allowing space for, for folks to communicate in a mode and in a way that resonates with them and not trying to force people into one way. Um, and also promoting and examining what transparency means for this group, how we're open with our minutes, how we do communication with the rest of the library so that people feel um, that they can communicate freely in that space and also have um, the ability to, to communicate sort of laterally and vertically it's pretty consistently. Um, so more empowerment strategies, um, we did our best to encourage diversity of thought. And part of that is um, talking about who's actually at the table, which I'll get to momentarily. Capacity building through knowledge sharing um, so that these silos of information, trying to break those down and get people to share um, really actively in the group. And part of that is setting the stage for folks to feel comfortable to make that happen. Perspective taking, which is um, just a way of, uh, you know, being empathetic about other people's um, points of view and understanding where they're coming from, which is both personal experience and work experiments experience. And then also embracing experimental iterative approaches to projects, um, which is basically being okay to fail, <laughs> um, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, so how did we map actions that we actually took to these strategies, these values um, that we held locally uh, to make the shared governance of the ILS happen? Um, and the first is being purposeful about who's at the table, recognizing that folks are bringing their own experiences along with their work experience. And that's part of those strategies of shared governance, diversity of thought and perspective taking. Um, we're only as good as um, the the system is only as good as the, the folks who are at the table building it. It's really important to understand that influence. Um, creating space for different modes of communication, um, fostering opening, which ties to the strategies of fostering open communication, investing in group dynamics. Um, encouraging ownership of the Apricot project through co-facilitation. I may be at, I may be the, the chair, but I have co-facilitators. Um, who are on a steering committee with me that help to build the agendas, that help to lead the meetings, so that processes aren't fall, like falling to just one individual, not just one person owns these processes, and this is a bit of an unlearning um, for our organization. And uh, finally, allowing for failure and embracing iteration, allowing things to to try things, have it not work, you know, not getting your ego too attached, again, on your organizational unlearning uh, for us at Berkeley. Um, so a couple just like where the rubber hits the road <laughs> examples. Um, so we use the fist of five decision making process, which allows folks to um, to vote with like their fingers. So it allows for nuance and understanding how people are contributing to a decision. We also at Apricot use the anti-oppressive facilitation guide for democratic processes, which is a set of principles that leads our facilitation um, and ties in with that making space and diversity of thought. We do configuration working sessions um, via Zoom um, where uh, you know folks will get together, share screens, actively make configuration changes in our sandbox environment and test together. We've been doing consistent temperature checks to see how folks are doing, <laughs> um, making sure that we're on, on task and seeing if there's anything that we need to change and be agile about. Um, we are starting a Slack channel for 
um, our apricot group so folks can communicate outside of these bi-weekly meetings that we have. I mentioned co-creating agendas, and we also are agile about creating time-limited project teams and task forces to honor folks' work and also keep that scoped so that people aren't committing um, necessarily to super long-term projects, but can be brought in um, for expertise in these sort of defined spaces and so that they feel empowered to um, contribute in a way that is you know, best aligns with their skills and capacities. So the wrap up, and I think that I, <laughs> I raced through my slides to get to, <laughs> to nine o'clock. Um, the wrap up is, is really, you know, um, allowing the space for people to, to lead from where they are has been a really important focus um, in, you know, our implementation of this huge, huge <laughs> shared ILS uh, for UC Berkeley and for um, the SILS project uh, as a whole. So I think I took us down for a landing. That's um, all that I have. And I think we're just one minute past time. And I'm trying to answer as many questions on the Slack channel as I can, furiously typing. Thanks for having us, Kofilib. Thank you, Jackie and Salwa. All right. With that, we made it to lunch. Woo! But before you go to lunch, hold on, hold on. I gotta say some words. If you are giving a talk this afternoon, please, I beg you, for the love of all of us, come to the podium during lunch to load your talk onto our handy dandy hardware. Don't make it hard for our tech team. They're helping us. I'm amazed they're still functional right now. Um, also, now is a great time to sign up for a lightning talk or suggest a breakout session on the flip charts in the lobby. You know you have other good ideas out there. The food is located out in the atrium, just outside of the conference room. Please pull up your meal pre-order survey so that way you can remember what you had for lunch. And now lunch has started. It will be going till 1.15. Please come back. You get more of me. 